All right, welcome back. So today we're we're a little bit ahead of where I want to be um, at this point in the semester. So I thought what we would do today is we have a little bit of material to finish up about polymorphism. This is a slippery topic. We'll come back and talk about it more on Monday. We're not talk done talking about polymorphism. We're definitely not done giving you guys a chance to apply it, do some problems. Um, so we'll, we'll finish up a little bit of, of things that slipped out from Wednesday, and then we're going to go forward. Um, no, we're not, actually. Sorry. I'm, I'm in default mode. Uh, we're going to pause today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about objects. We'll look at some of the homework problems, including um, yesterday's homework problem, which is one of my favorites. It's a CS125 classic. Um, and then I'll take questions about objects. If we have time at the end, I have some material in the slide deck about packaging and build systems um, that we can go through. We don't have to talk about that sort of bonus content. Um, it's not particularly exciting, um, I'll say that. So I would encourage you to use this as a chance to get your questions answered about objects. Um, so that's our plan for today. All right, so let's go back to last time. Um, we've talked this week about inheritance. And then we, so we've talked about how we establish relationships between classes in Java. And last time we started to talk about the fact that when we establish these relationships, and every object, type of object except for one in Java is actually an instance of at least two types of object because we also pointed out that if you don't explicitly extend a class, you inherit from capital O object. So you get some of those methods to string hash code equals. Last time we introduced this new idea of, of, of what's called polymorphism. And this is this idea that as the word implies, objects in Java can behave like several different types of objects, depending on where they are in the class hierarchy. So everything in Java can behave both like whatever type it is and like a capital O object. And these objects can sort of morph into different types depending on the requirements of the function that's running and, and, and where we are in the code. So we're going to look at some more examples of this. Um, we... So, in, in, in this is, and we're actually going to look at a couple of other examples of polymorphism in Java. There's actually three different ways that polymorphism plays a role in the design of the Java language. This is sometimes referred to as subtype polymorphism. Because in Java, every object is really an instance of two different, at least two classes, except for capital O objects. So, I have a pet class here. Um, a pet class is an instance of which two types of Java object? Every object is at least two. If I create a new pet, it's both a pet and a capital O object, right? So it can also act. It can morph into a capital O object. What about a dog? So an instance of a dog is a dog. It can also act like a pet because it explicitly extends pet. It can, it can also act like or morph into a capital O object because pet implicitly extends capital O object. So every pet is an object, and every dog is also a pet and also an object. Now, there are consequences. There are, there's an impact that happens when we start to uh, look at, for example, a dog as a pet or as an object. And we'll, we'll, we'll show you that uh, both today and a little bit on Monday. Right? Um, there's a trade-off here. Um, if, I, if I look at a dog as an object, I don't get this print me method that's defined uh, on the pet class. Instead, I can only use the methods that are defined by object. Okay. So we noticed last time that we can do things like this. So here my example class defines a static method called print anything that takes an instance of an object is an argument. The type of the argument to print anything is object. And so, you know, it was a little confusing to us at first that I could actually pass something that wasn't an object. I could pass a pet to print anything. I could pass a dog to print anything. This code will run and do the right thing. The reason for that is because Java will upcast objects automatically. What is upcasting? So upcasting means allowing an object to morph into something that's higher than it on the class hierarchy. 
So object is the root of our hierarchy, and so any Java object can be cast, upcast automatically to a capital O object. So for example, when I, when I run this code on line 11, I take something that I've declared as a dog on line nine, I pass it to this print anything function, and when I do that, Java will automatically take my dog instance and morph it into an instance of an object because it inherits from object. I could also write print anything to take a pet. And in that case, my dog would be upcasted to a pet. So, you know, again, this, this works fine, right? One thing I want to, uh, to point out here, just as a little preview, because we'll talk about this again on Monday. Let me add a method to the pet class here. Let's add a public int get age. Well, how about, how about we do this? Let's just do a little example here where we'll add an age field to my pet class. My market is protected, meaning that both that class and any descendants of that class can use it. And now, let's imagine, well, you know what, if I'm gonna put this here, I should really have a, a method here. So let's uh, have a public um, int get age. I'm just gonna write a, a getter for my age. I'm gonna return age. Let's initialize this to zero. And then I'll also write a, a setter for it. So public void set age int set age. Age is equal to set age. Okay, so I've added a, a protected field in this case, and using my usual naming convention, I've also added setters and getters for that age. Okay, great. So now every pet is gonna have an age that I can retrieve using my setters and getters. And that includes a dog. But let's, let's see what happens down here in my print anything method. So, so now let's, let's try this. Public static void print age. And again, let's take an object to print. And let's call system.out.println to print dot, what I call it, get age. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sort of following the pattern I followed before, right? And this should work, right? You know? It's gonna happen when I run this. Huh. Okay, so this is strange. I have a compiler error on line 26. This line where I try to print the age of this object by calling get age. Why can't I do this? What is wrong with this piece of code? This will not work, and it won't work. Why? Yeah. Well, I'm not actually doing any explicit downcasting here. Um, I, I would have to downcast this for this to work, but why doesn't it work? Yeah. Well, but a dog inherits from pet, right? So I'm gonna get those, that's not a problem. Both of the objects that I've passed to this method have a get age method. I just added it to pet. One of them's a pet, the other's a dog. Dog inherits from pet, so dog's gonna get that method. Why can't I do this? Yeah. So, exactly. So I can't guarantee that every object that's passed to my print age method is going to have an age, a get age um, method. So, let me, let me show you what could happen here. So let's say I create a string. I create, okay, and now I, now let's imagine I pass, um, I try to pass my string to print age. So a string's an object, so I can upcast it to object, but a string doesn't have an age field or a get age method. And so this is the trade-off, and again, we'll talk about this more on Monday, but I just wanted to show you this, because in case you, you were thinking that polymorphism was a lot more exciting than it actually is. The trade-off is, when I upcast objects, they lose capabilities. So by upcasting the object to, by upcasting my dog and my pet to an object, to pass them to this print age method, they have lost their get age function. I can't call it anymore. And the reason I can't call it is because I can't guarantee that every single Java object has this get age method. On line 25, I'm allowed to do this because I can guarantee that every Java object has a print 
a toString method because it's defined by the object class. So when I upcast that Java objects, I gain generality. So I can call print anything on any Java object, but I can only use the methods that I know every Java object is going to have. And those are only the methods that are defined on the object class. So for example, if I change this to a pet, okay, so now let's say that my print age function takes a pet. Will this work? Right, so, so now I'm, I'm not trying to upcast all the way to object, I'm just gonna upcast to pet. Can, will this now, should this code work? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm still trying to call print age with a string, but let's just get rid of that. Let's imagine that I call print age, just go back to my original example here, and I'll do a call to print age, choo choo print age sys. Will this work? Yeah. No problem. So now I'm upcasting both to a pet, but the Java compiler knows that every pet is going to have this get age method because I've declared the get age method as part of the pet class. So anything that's a pet or that can be upcasted to a pet is going to have this method. So this is the trade off. But again, we'll, we'll come back and, and, and uh, reinforce this on Monday. I just wanted you to see this as a little bit of a preview. Whenever I upcast or downcast objects in Java, Java still knows what the actual type of the object is. So if I override the toString method um, in, a, in a class and then I pass it to Printlin, for example, Printlin actually just calls toString. And it can do this because it knows that every object in Java has a toString method and therefore can, be, um, can provide some type of useful string representation. Yeah. Tell me what you want to try. Yeah, I called it, I called it right here. Yeah, yeah, but, but why can I do that? So the question was, can I call get age on a dog? I can, why? Dog extends pet. So dog inherits everything that pet has. Pet is what, we can't see this now, I should have made this a little bit smaller. I defined my age on pet. So anything that extends pet now has this get age method. So for example, if I created a new, this is gonna make Ziz happy, if I created a new cat class, I don't even have to do anything with this class, but now if I say, create a new cat, still works. Anything that extends age now inherits this method. And that field, too, because I marked it as protected. Yeah, David. Ah. It's a great question, and, and again, we will come back. So let's, let's try to do this. Who can make a prediction about what's gonna happen here? David got two slides ahead of us. So what, this, this is not going to compile, I can try it. Yeah. So what the, what the compiler is telling me is you can't assign a pet to a dog variable. The reason is a pet, when I created, um, on the right side, I created a new pet. And when I ran the constructor and Java created the object, it set up all these things that are appropriate to a pet. But now I'm trying to treat it like a dog. So for example, what happens if a dog as, you know, we looked at this last time, like a new breed field. So that field didn't get set up by the dog constructor. And so there's, there's no way to ever do this. I can't take something, a, an object, and then downcast it to, to something that it wasn't original. I can only, so, so here's one thing I can do. I can create, if I create a dog, I can upcast it to pet. 
and then I can say choo choo as a dog is equal to dog choo choo. That works. We'll we'll talk. Uh, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let's let's come back and talk about this on Monday because we'll have more more chance to practice. Okay, good. And and I just want to remind you that this is this is because of this principle, and, and I want to point out one of the uh, results of the Liskov substitution principle. So the Liskov substitution principle essentially says that I can, this is a principle applied to programming language design. It says if I take a method that's supposed to operate on a particular type, then I can replace the inputs with subtypes. And we just saw that in action when we did our print anything method back here. So print anything took an object, but when I passed to it, was a pet or a dog. And the Liskov substitution principle says because those are both subtypes of object, you know, somewhere down the tree, I can replace them, um, I can replace the object argument with one of them without, uh, without breaking the desirable properties of the function that I have. So I, I want to ask a question about this. Okay. And, and this is, so because of the Liskov substitution principle and substitutability in practice, every Java object has a two-string method, a hash code method, and an equals method. And these are quite useful. And in fact, when we talk in the third part of the class about data structures, we're going to make use of these methods. And it's really, really useful that every Java method provides an equals. Every Java object provides an equals method. It's really useful that every Java object provides a hash code method. That allows me to write general purpose data structures that can operate on many, many different types of Java objects. But here's a question about this. One, there, there's something that has to be true in order for this principle to hold. There's something that I, I have to make sure that objects cannot do in Java. So we've seen when I inherit from another class, when I extend another class, I can add methods to it. That's the whole idea of inheritance. I take all the features of one class, and I have some new things I want to add, and so I extend that class, and I add my new fields or my new methods or whatever, and now I have a new class that gets all of the nice desirable properties of the parent class and any of the, the parent's parents all the way up to object, but I can still make changes that might allow me to model different types of data or perform different types of behavior. What can I not do? So I'm allowed to add methods when I extend a class. But in order for substitutability to hold, I have to not be able to do something else. What can I not do when I extend a class? Yeah. Oh no, I can override methods. That's important. So, so I, can, I can change the behavior of methods defined by my parent. That's how I implement toString, for example, right? But you're on the right track. I can override those methods, but what can I not do to them? Delete them. I can't decide. So for example, let's go back and look at, look at an example of this. Maybe this is back here. So my dog class extends pet. Pet doesn't provide to string, but it also extends object, which provides to string. In my dog class, I've got two choices. I can take whatever default toString method was provided to me. So if I don't implement toString, I'm going to get the default object toString method, which we looked at before. This is not very useful. So I can override toString, which is what I did in this example. And that allows me to print something else. But I can't say I don't want to implement toString anymore. I'm not allowed to get rid of that method. There's no, there's no syntax for it. I can't even show you how to do it. You know, I can't say like, I don't know, you know, delete to string or something like that. Or, you know, I don't want to implement to string. There, there's no syntax for this in Java. It's, it's impossible. I can override the methods. I can change the behavior. Or I can use whatever I inherited. But I cannot get rid of it. The reason for this is really important because if I go back to my print anything example, where'd it go? Yeah. So if some Java objects implemented toString but some didn't, 
then I couldn't call it in my, in my uh, print anything method. So if I allowed objects to opt out of implementing a particular method uh, that they inherited, then this, this wouldn't work. And we would lose a lot of the desirable print, uh, features created by substitutability. So again, as an, uh, when you design a class, if you inherit from another class, you get all the behavior and the state from that other class. You can change how you implement the functions, but you can't remove them. You can't say, I don't want to, to implement that function. Okay, good. So because I can't do this, every Java object implements two string. I've been saying that over and over again, but that's a surprisingly powerful uh, feature of the language that's brought about because of inheritance and because of polymorphism. You can implement it differently, and you know, in a lot of cases when you're debugging, it's very helpful to implement toString, to override toString, provide your own implementation for your class that prints off useful information so that you can debug your code, um, but you can't uh, get rid of it. So I want to connect this with something that we've seen in the past. Where have we seen this before? Same names, different behavior. So again, I can take an object, pass to a method, and I can call to string, and depending on what kind of object it is, I might get one output or another output. But I've seen this before. Yeah, in the back. Exactly. So we saw this, keep forgetting this isn't working today. We saw this when we looked at method overloading. Same names, I've got two int functions, different behavior. Behavior in this case determined by the types of their arguments. And in this case, they're both doing the same thing, but if I wanted to, I can implement them totally different. Right? So this is another type of polymorphism in Java. They're actually three that we're going to see this semester. We've been talking about subtype polymorphism today, yesterday, and on Monday. Um, method overloading is a different type of polymorphism. Again, the same thing can behave differently, um, you know, de depending on the context. And then we'll also talk about generic classes a little bit later, later in the course. All right. Any questions about this? We will talk about, continue to talk about polymorphism on Monday. This is a tough thing to wrap your mind around, but these are, you know, again, this is not a part of the class that's supposed to be difficult from the perspective of the programming tasks we're asking you to do, but they are conceptually difficult, right? Thinking about relationships between different types of objects. Um, this is only going to get more cool, a little bit uh, more complicated for the next few weeks because we'll be talking about some other object-oriented features. Other questions before we do a little bit of review? So you guys, I can hear you talking up here. Yeah. yeah, so I would appreciate if you didn't do that, the entire lecture. All right, so I'm happy to do kind of any of the problems you guys have looked at. Um, does anyone, does anyone want to see Flip? Was that? The one, okay, not too many hands. Let's, uh, let's fast forward a little bit here. How about last 10? Anyone want to see last 10? Okay, let's, let's do this. I think this would be useful. So um, I really like this problem. Uh, it's one of my favorites because um, people can, um, you know, really sort of go off. I mean, first of all, it's a fun problem. gets at objects. Um, but there's ways to, de to design really overly complicated solutions to this, right? And so I want to show you the right way to do this. And I will also go through some examples of, of what not to do, uh, drawn again from last semester. Right, so the, whenever you have one of these problems, by far the most important thing to do is to understand what is being asked of you, to understand the specification. So in this case, we were asking you to create a new type called last 10, a new class. The class should contain two public methods. So there's one method called add that allows you to add new values to the class. And then I have, and so that's sort of like a setter, kind of, you know, these are like a little bit of a twist on a typical setter and getter because I'm setting potentially one of multiple values. And then the, the second one is called get last 10. And that method is supposed to return the last 10 values that were added to the class using the add method. So you need to provide a constructor that took no arguments. And then we told you that the, the class should not expose any of its internal state publicly. And I'll, I'll, talk, I'll, I'll talk about what that means in a sec. Okay, so 
Let me pull some examples of how people approach this problem, and we'll look at them together. Okay. So here is, and, and, and again, these are correct. This is correct code. Um, not always the best way to do it. And I, and I have like a little, it's not, well, maybe, maybe it was correct. Um, maybe this one was not correct. Yeah, okay, well, this one it seems like it's wrong, actually. Um, well, let's look at this together just to get a sense of how, how people approach the problem. So I have a, I have my constructor that takes no arguments, and this approach is using the constructor to initialize the, um, to reinitialize the array, which is a little bit confusing. So if you look at, um, so, so how does this, how do we set up this class? So it has a public array of integers that's calling storage, and then, and I can do this when, when, when I initialize my class, I create space for 10 integers, so that's correct. In the constructor, um, for some reason, I am now, um, re I'm now resetting that value. This isn't gonna change anything, but it's not necessary. So let's clean this up a little bit. All right, so I don't need to do this because I did it up here. I, I, you can do it either place, right? I can, you know, in this case, I could do the initialization of this array inside the constructor, or I could do it um, statically in the class declaration. Either one of those works, but I don't, I shouldn't do it both places. And then I've got um, this line in my constructor that says storage is equal to value. Oh, I see what they were doing, yeah, okay. This is even more confusing. So what, what was happening is I was creating a new local variable called value that was an int, uh, array of ints. I was, you know, initializing that to be able to store 10 integer values, and then I was setting my storage to that value. So I don't, I don't need to do either one of these things. And so I don't actually need to do any setup in my constructor. Okay. So let's look, so I've, I've also got two other pieces of state um, here that this solution is uh, maintaining. One of them is called store, and the other is called count. These are both integers. I'm not exactly sure what both of these are for, but let's, but let's look and try to get a sense of what's going on. Okay. So I'm in my add method. And clearly add has to put the value somewhere in the array. That, you know, that, that, that we know because I need to be able to retrieve it later. So this class is remembering things. It remembers the last 10 integers that you added. So I'm on the right track, I've got my array that stores 10 integers, and so I have space to store the number of values that I need to, to, uh, to return. Now in my add method, I have some logic here, and, and this looks sort of correct, where essentially what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to figure out, you know, if I'm at the end of the array, what do I do? So the first few times I add values, I might put them in slot zero, slot one, slot two, but what happens when I get to slot 10? I can't keep adding there, I have, to, I have to do something else with that value. And so what I can do is I can just loop back to the beginning. And if you think about it, this will always maintain the last 10 integers in the array. You don't need to do anything more complicated. When the first time through, so, so imagine I have an array of size 10, I start at index zero and I go up to index nine. So at that point I've added 10 values and they're all in my array. Now if I loop back to the beginning, my 11th value overwrites the first value, which is what I want, because I'm now I'm storing, you know, the second one that was added, the third all the way up to the 11th. The 12th value overrides the second, which is what I want, because I'm now I'm storing the third all the way up to the 12th, and so on and so on. And so if I just keep looping through the array, putting values in, that's going to work. I'm not exactly sure if this uh, code accomplishes this. Let's try to indent it properly so we can read it. Um, fix some of the issues with the braces. So um, it, it, it looks close to me. Um, so what, what I, what's happening here, I'm resetting the, the, the value that I'm using to figure out where to store things. For some reason, this is called store. Um, if it's greater than or equal to zero, then I'm setting it to zero. Um, otherwise, I'm putting my new value in and I'm increasing uh, both store and count. And I'm not exactly sure what count does. Um, What's a problem with this? Can someone already see a, a bug with this piece of code? 
again, I was trying to pick correct solutions. Clearly I failed because this one is not correct. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the problem is what happens when I get to value 10? So values zero through nine work fine, but once store is 10, so I'm incrementing store every time I come through here. Once store is 10, I set it to zero, which is right. I want to start back at the front of the array. But then I never store the value because I don't get to this else if statement. Remember an if statement, if I execute one branch, I don't execute any of the others. And so for the 10th value, I'm gonna reset my counter properly. So I'm gonna go back to the beginning of the array, but I'm gonna skip that value. So essentially, this will store values one through 10. The 11th value is gonna be dropped. Then it's gonna store values 12 through whatever, right? And so every time I get back to the front, I'm missing a value. Okay, so, so what I really wanna do is I wanna move this out of, my else sta out of my else statement. I'm sorry, this is all indented with four rather than two. That's okay, I won't let that bother me. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna bump my store, I'm gonna bump this count variable that I'm not sure about yet, um, and, and, I'm, and I'm done. So this now will, will work. You know, it essentially maintains the store counter properly. When store gets to 10, um, I set it back to zero, I store the new value, I increment store. Again, I don't know what count is doing yet, but we're gonna find out, I think, in a minute. Um, and then I increment this count variable. Okay, so that, that's what their ad looks like. Um, Okay, so now let's look at get last 10. And this is one of the places where the misconceptions, I think, about how to solve the problem really start to come into play. I'm actually not exactly sure what this code is trying to do. Um, but what part of the problem description do you feel like this person missed? Again, I don't know what's going on down here, right? So essentially, um, if count is less than 10, it's returning, I don't know what's going on here. I think it's shifting values around. That sort of looks like what this is an attempt to do, but not exactly sure. But what, what part of the problem description did we maybe not, not understand? Maybe the problem description was, was, uh, was unclear. Let's go back and look at it, I'll make sure. Um, what about this, didn't we necessarily, this shows a little bit of a misunderstanding, yeah. Well, okay, right, so it says, if fewer than 10 values were added, you should return zeros in their place. So, uh, what the problem is saying is, like, if I add one, two, and I ask you for the last 10 values, you should give me one, two, and then eight zeros. If I add one, two, three, four, five, and, I'll ask for the last, if, if, and then I ask for the last 10 values, you should give me one through five, followed by five zeros. So, you know, this, this may be a misunderstanding of this particular part. Um, when, when count is, once count gets to 10, this is doing the right thing. Except that it's hurting my eyes because it has uh, incorrect uh, if else statement placement. Um, otherwise, it's, it's going through and do this. So, so we don't really need to need this. What, what can this piece of code do? Well, let's, let's try compiling it again and see if it, if it, oh, well, well, what's going, I mean, there's another bug here. What's going on? Uh, can somebody help me fix one of the compiler errors? Yeah. Yeah, this is like, this is not valid uh, Java syntax. Actually, you know what? This might actually return an int, but don't do anything like this. I mean, this is, so, so there's a return statement in here sometime, somehow. Doesn't seem like it's in the right spot. Let's fix that. So let's do this, um, and then we'll put our return down here. And now, how about I just cut out this top branch? Okay. So let's see if this works. Um, okay. That looks correct. Yeah. Now, 
what are we not, so I've got a little piece of testing code down here, I'm looping through, I'm adding things, um, and then I'm printing off the last 10 values that were added. Here I added values zero through 31. So the last 10 values start at 31 and go down, right? So I should see 31, 30, and all the way down to 22, that looks correct. What should I test here? based on their implementation, though. There, there's, a, there's a case I want to make sure still works. Yeah. Yeah, I should test the case where I add fewer than 10 values, because there, there's special code, there's, there's a special case up here. Let's try, like, eight. Okay. And that looks right. Yeah. So I've got zero through seven, which are the first eight values that were added, and I've got those two zeros at the end. How can I make this a little bit simpler? Yeah, in the back. That's one way, we'll, we'll get there. How else can I make it simpler? Let's start with an array. Oh, okay, so this is a great question, yeah. So, let me do this. This is an interesting observation about arrays that I wanna share with you. So, what, and let's say I just get rid of this too as well. So I'm, I'm actually not gonna add anything to this. What am I gonna get? I'm calling a function here from the arrays package in Java to just print off the array nicely. That's all that's doing. Um, what is this going to look like? Great question. If I don't do anything, so I haven't initialized that array at all. I've just, you know, I just set it to a new array of ints. When I create an array of ints in Java, what, what is the default value for all of those? So I don't need to do any zero filling ever, right? I'm gonna get all zeros. If it was doubles, what would be the default value? Zero, if it was uh, Booleans, anyone know the default value? False. What about uh, characters? Actually, don't know, it's probably zero too, which is probably some, some weird, like, null terminator or something. Okay, so I, I don't think I need to do any of that, but let's keep trying to clean this up a little bit, right? So it, it doesn't look like I actually need to do, worry about this case. So why don't I just do this? Okay, let's try this, let's see if this works. And I'm still looking at the case where I'm going from zero through eight, that seems to work okay. Let me try a case where I go through more values, let's go up to 32, still seems to work okay. Remember, I told you that you could return them in any order. This solution did seem to understand that, because they did return them that way, okay? Um, somebody else suggested before, I can make this a little bit simpler. How do I, and, and they suggested a way to do that. So, so we're honing in on kind of the perfect solution here. Um, so right now, I've eliminated the use of my count variable, because I don't care how many values were added, so I can get rid of my count variable. So now let's zero in on add. I can make this a little bit simpler. We're getting close, this is already much better. But I can do add in two lines. How? This is sort of back to the beginning of the semester review. Anyone remember string rotation? Rotate right, rotate left. What did I do there that, that made my life a little bit easier? So, so first of all, Let's do this. So this, this I need to do clearly, right? So I'm storing the value. The first time this happens, the value store will be zero. The second time, I need to update it. So I store in the, in the next spot in the array, then I'm gonna put the value in. And then I have, if I just do store plus plus, this will work fine for smaller values. And at some point, it dies, because I get to an array x out of bounds exception. So, I need to make sure it stays within zero through 10. How can I do that? Yeah. Yeah, so I can do store is equal to store plus one mod 10. And now this works. So I'm adding one to store, but before I save the value, resave the value in store, I'm using the modulus operator. And, and you know, the, the suggestion was that I use um, storage.length here, which is nice, I like that, let's do that. Does the same thing, 
But this way, if I decide to change the number of values in my storage array, it's still going to work. I don't need a default constructor that doesn't do anything at this point. Um, I'm very close to being done. I can change this to store larger numbers of values. That's pretty cool. Um, what's, I, there's one last thing I'm doing here that I don't want to do. Let me go down here. 10.store is equal to zero. I just broke your class. You thought you were done. But I, I don't know, I didn't read, you didn't, like, I didn't read your documentation. I just thought I could, like, change stuff in your class, right? You know, so why doesn't this, why doesn't this work now? It's only storing one value. Because every time I call add, you know, again, again like, I'm, I may not even be malicious. I'm just dumb. I don't, you know, again, I, I don't know. I found this code on Chegg or Stack Overflow or something, and it looked right, so, you know, I, I tried it, and it's not working. God, your code is so broken. What's wrong? What do you, you, you should not, you, you can prevent this from happening. Why, why is this, why is this happening? Why can I do this? Yeah. Yeah. So you have decided to allow me to modify the internal state of your class. Now if I do this, can't do it, right? So whenever you design a class in Java, you want to think about how somebody else might use it. That might, other person might be you. That other person might be your project partner for the final project. That other person might be some rando on the internet that you've never met before, right, who can't read documentation. Um, you know, allowing somebody to mess with the internal state of your class is never a good idea. And this is what Java's visibility modifiers are designed to do. So if I can change your counter variable from outside the class, then I can break your code because you don't know what it should be. I can also, here's the other thing I can do, right? So if you don't mark this as public, then I can just do last 10 dot storage i is equal to zero. Oh, right, I've gotta, <laughs> gotta do this myself here. There we go. And your class still doesn't work because you're allowing me to modify that array, right? I shouldn't be able to modify that array. The two functions I should be able to use on your class are add and get last 10. If you give me the ability to muck around, you know, and again, it's not that people are malicious. It's just that they, you know, they, they, made, mis they made a mistake, right? They didn't understand the documentation that did something wrong. Okay, questions about this? It's a good example. There's one more of these I want to show you. This is just a cautionary tale. Um, okay. Here we go. Okay. So this is... You know, I mean, it's not terrible, but clearly it's like, uh, actually, I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Oh, you know what? What is this doing? So, so clearly, it's like the get, la the get last 10 part looks correct. It's just returning the array. Um, the initialization is fine. What, what is this doing? That it does, I mean, add is clearly like a little bit more complicated than we might want. Yeah, in the back. I think it's moving all the values around. Yeah, it looks like it's actually like moving everything and then it always puts the new value at the end, right? Which you don't need to do. So we found this code on Chegg, all right? Yeah, we're, we got, we're on Chegg. Um, and I just wanna like, so look, we have 150 core staff in this, in this class. We answer questions on the forum tw like 24 hours a day. I don't understand why anyone would go and ask a question on a site where this is the kind of result you're going to get, right? This is the expert answer, all right? Um, if this was a good answer, I still wouldn't feel very good about it, but it's not a good answer, 
All right? So if you really want to learn how to program in this class, please take advantage of the resources that we've made available for you. Right? I know that most of you guys aren't doing this, but some of you are, and you know, I don't care one way or another. I just wish you were getting better advice than this, right? Because this is, this is you know, another example of someone who didn't read the problem very right carefully. All right, um, I'm done with those examples. And I do not have time to do the, um, the packaging stuff, which is fine. Any last questions about objects in our review session? We have homework problem out today. We'll have more homework next week. We're going to keep walking you through this one step at a time. Just like, so just let me sort of, um, you know, warn you, I know that we started off sort of slowly with objects over the past couple of weeks, but we're going to continue, uh, you know, moving forward, and the quizzes are going to get uh, more difficult, right? So on some level, we start, we, we sort of reset with objects. Uh, if you look at the quiz scores, you guys did quite well on the first object quiz, congratulations. Um, but, you know, next week's one is going to be a little bit trickier. The one after that will be a little bit trickier. Um, that's sort of where we're going with things. So if you're a little confused about this stuff, now is the time to make sure you get some help and solidify some of these ideas. All right, so MB2 is out. I reopened the lab exercise from this week for you guys to practice um, on over the weekend. So that's available. Please don't spend too much time on that. It's designed to be fun. The last two were kind of hard. The last one in particular is pretty devilish. Um, I have my usual office hours today. As a reminder, for your calendars, we will not have lecture next Wednesday. Uh, I'll be out of town. Um, if you guys have feedback about the class, please leave it on the website, and we will start responding to that on the forum. Have a great weekend. Please work on MP2. The early deadline is Monday. I will see you on Monday.